want to welcome you on behalf of Animal to the first ever Power Panel. It's an idea that we put together in the past years. We've done seminars in the cage, which were very cool, and the idea was to disseminate information to you guys. Uh, but as you know how crazy the expo is and how loud it is, it's, it's a tough environment. So we figured we would uh, test this out and, and see how things would go in a private room, give you guys an intimate setting, and you have a really cool opportunity this morning. We have two sessions. Um, we've got the three gentlemen here to the left, which I'll introduce in a minute. And we've got an hour with these guys, and then we're going to have a second session uh, starting at 10.30. And that's going to have Frank McGrath, Andre Milanachev, and Brandon Lilly. So you guys are welcome to stick around for that whole thing. So as I was saying, this is a really cool, unique opportunity. You guys are going to get a chance to ask you know, all your questions to these guys, speak to them, and really learn. We've got some pretty amazing athletes up here. Immediately to my left, we have Evan Sentapani, IFBB Pro, uh, just competed last night at the Arnold Classic. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm sure he'll expound upon it later, but he'll be competing uh, next week at the Australian Pro Contest as well. To his left, we have Sam Bird, uh, multiple world records in the squat, uh, great power lifter, ex-Marine, lawyer, and all around pretty cool guy. To his left, we have Dan Green. Many multiple records, which uh, I don't have time to go down the list, but uh, he just crushed some recently at uh, Royal Unity a few weeks ago. And some really amazing stuff. I mean, he, he beat the record for uh, world record total in, for guys who compete with knee wraps, but he did it without knee wraps. So if you think about that, it's just amazing. And uh, if I'm not wrong, Sam, did he beat one of your squat records just recently? Okay, so we'll, we can talk about that as well. Um, I kind of wanted to start off the discussion because we have this unique opportunity and we have a mix of bodybuilders and powerlifters here. And I just wanted these guys to maybe talk about the similarities between bodybuilding and powerlifting. And there are a lot. They share a lot. What's cool about Sam and Dan is they're kind of leading the way in what I think is like the new wave of powerlifters with guys with great physiques. You know, there's, there's, for good or for better or for worse, there's uh, sometimes... People think of powerlifters as fat and out of shape, and these guys are changing that perception. You don't have to be. You can be lean. You can have a great physique, and you know who doesn't want to look good and be strong at the same time? I think we all do. So uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to Evan, and we'll pass the mic down and have these guys talk about those similarities, and then uh, we can open up discussion to you guys for questions and stuff. Well, when I change over to powerlifting, I'm going to just be big and fat because I'm sick of dieting. <laughs> um, granted, I'm not a powerlifter, um, but based on my perception of powerlifting and what I do know about it, um, I, do th I think it does share a lot of similarities with bodybuilding <clears throat> in that, I mean, obviously they're two sports which involve a great amount of physicality. Um, and I think they both require a push I guess what you could argue for a lot of sports, but they, they both require a lot of push beyond what is um, what you think is possible of, of the, human, the human body, be it in, in terms of strength or in terms of physique development. And I think the two sports that are, are very um, consuming and very competitive and require a lot of work, you know, it's, uh, and this, this just may be my ignorance talking, but it seems like a lot of times uh, you see maybe NFL players and say, well, this guy got arrested. He was out at this nightclub and things like that. And I don't think most bodybuilders or powerlifters go out to nightclubs because they're so consumed in what they're trying to accomplish uh, that there's no time for any of that. <laughs> um, then again, I guess you could probably say that most people at the top of the sport, be it uh, you know NFL player, powerlifter, bodybuilder, whoever, uh, it's safe to say that they're probably putting in a lot of time and effort, and they are maybe making it more 24-7, uh, depending on the, the degree uh, to which they care about it or how good they want to be. But I think bodybuilding and powerlifting are both very, uh, they, they encompass a lot. They, they are a, a very much a lifestyle. You can't go to practice, come home, relax, you know. Um, it, the more serious you get about it, it seems to, it, it seems to take over a little bit more. I'm going to let Sam, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hear these guys' perspective of bodybuilding before I, I, I blab my mouth too much about power. Just real quick, I, I know that in your training, you incorporate all three of the power lifts in your training. Uh, barbell bench press, which a lot of bodybuilders don't do nowadays. A squat, deadlift, I know you get, you're a big believer in those basics. 
yeah, I think that to be a good bodybuilder, I mean, I'm like, there, there are some guys I think who are just very genetically gifted that they don't maybe they don't need to do certain things. But I found that to get the most out of my physique and my time in the gym, that I do need to put a lot of emphasis on those those basic movements, bench squat, deadlift, because uh, the movements that, that seem to work and they seem to develop uh, you know, a certain ruggedness and thickness to your body that you're not going to get from a lot of other movements. And um, granted, I'm not a power lifter, so I'm not trying to um, flat out see how much weight I can move. But I think in order for those movements to be the most effective, even for, you know, for mass and muscle building, they need to be done um, with a considerable amount of weight. If you're going to squat, you're going to deadlift, you're going to bench press, you have to place your body under uh, the maximal load to, you know, you're not doing an isolation movement, you're not doing it for, you know, the, the squeeze or for the feel or for the pump. You're doing it to make your body kind of think to itself, holy shit, I got to move this or I'm going to get crushed. And that's how your body uh, responds positively, adapts, you know, to, to change by reinforcing itself and making itself bigger and thicker and stronger to withstand that stress. Um, so in that regard, yeah, we do def I, I anyways take a lot from powerlifting, especially seeing these guys uh, lift in the cage. It's a reminder of what it is possible to do. You know, if, if I say I get under uh, a bar and I'm going to squat five plates or, you know, if I'm deep in an off season, I'm feeling really strong and I'm going to squat six. It's easy to approach that bar and go, holy shit, is this going to crush me? Um, but watching these guys, I think... And I don't know, but it's what it looks like to me that when they approach a certain weight, you have to be fearless. Um, and when you see other guys accomplish things, I think this happens in all sports, there'll be records that haven't been broken. You know, there'll be a long-standing long record, and uh, nobody's broken it, nobody's broken it. All of a sudden, someone pushes past it, all of a sudden, a whole bunch of people start breaking it because it's a reminder, all of a sudden, you know it is possible. So for me, seeing guys, you know, like these guys here, the stuff they do, it's a reminder of the fact that it is possible. Maybe I'm not going to do what they do, but that I can certainly push harder and I can do more than what I'm currently doing. I think we all uh, got into this iron game for pretty much the same reason, to get bigger, to get stronger. Some of us to get girls, some of us to get on the football team. Some of us to get guys. That, that too, maybe your preference. But, um, you know, somewhere, somewhere along the line, most people make a choice to go which path to go down, either bodybuilding or powerlifting, because it's very difficult mm -hmm. to walk that line sometimes. You know, of course, you have people who are able to get away with it. You've got Stan Efforting, who've had the, the heaviest uh, raw total for a while and a pro bodybuilder. You've got Johnny Jackson, who's got a great physique as well. I've uh, got an incredible deadlift, uh, pretty good bench and squat as well. He was a pro powerlifter back in the day when there was such a thing. Um, and there is a lot of carryover. Uh, you know, the Joe, Joe Weider and the Weider principles have, have invaded pretty much all of American culture, all of American lifting. Um, and it'd be difficult to find somebody who hasn't, you know, trained in that fashion of, in some sort or another. Um, but, you know, in powerlifting, there's, there's starting to be, I guess, a divide of those who, who do a lot of what we call accessory work, um, a lot of, I guess, what we call bodybuilding exercises, and those who do primarily uh, the power lifts and don't do a whole lot of variation on that. They train for specificity. Dan is one of those examples, I think. Um, he can expound on that a little bit later. But he, he seems to focus most of his training around just the squat, bench, and deadlift. And he doesn't do a whole lot of other stuff. Um, you know, you, you saw him with a shirt off, you'd think he's ready to, you know, he could drop some water, get on a bodybuilding stage. I saw him cut down to uh, the 220 class at his last meet. And uh, he, he looked you know, just as lean as, as a lot of the competitors I've seen at some of these um, big national level shows. Um, and he doesn't, he doesn't do any curls, he doesn't do any press downs, he doesn't do any of that stuff. And it uh, still blows my mind, I don't know how he does it. Um, I myself, I, I have a, a big mix. Um, you know, my training, it, it kind of evolves. I've got a, a volume phase where I do a lot of bodybuilding type movements. I try to stay away from the heavy stuff as long as I can. Um, I'm getting old and find myself I keep getting hurt all the time. And uh, I try to stay away from the heavyweight as long as I can because these days I just get strong long enough to get hurt. So I find that doing the bodybuilding movements allows me to build up some volume, to build up some strength without you know, putting, putting myself in uh, those positions to get hurt as much. And I'll gradually phase that into more specific work and heavier loads, so cut the volume back and, and 
just focus more on the squat bench and deadlift with heavier weights. Um, and I think you'll find a lot of powerlifting training, it waves the volume and intensity. Um, in powerlifting, we use the term intensity, uh, which means not how hard you're training, but how much weight is on the bar. And so we, we move from periods of a high volume, lower intensity, lower weight on the bar, more sets and reps, to less sets and reps, heavier weight on the bar, uh, and higher intensity and it kind of waves that way and it goes through through a phase and we'll hit a competition where we're at our heaviest weight and then we'll kind of back off a little bit. We'll drop the weight back down, increase the reps, do some of these maybe accessory exercises where we may have a weak point either you know, for bench press, tricep press downs or dips or whatever the case may be uh, just to bring up, uh, bring up weak points. Um, you know, I focus a lot on diet. I know Dan has a very strict diet. He's been working uh, with some people on his diet uh, to stay lean year round and it's not you know it's come to the point now in powerlifting where you've got to stay lean to be able to to keep up because there's just so much competition now that you've got to pack every ounce of muscle you can into the weight class and if you're carrying you know much more than eight or ten percent body fat you're giving away a huge advantage to your competition you just can't afford to do that right now um, you know, other than that, uh, the, the similarities, I like to focus more on, I guess, one of the differences, in, and I talk about this a lot, that the difference that I see in powerlifting and bodybuilding, and the reason why I took the road towards powerlifting instead of bodybuilding, is I love bodybuilders, I admire what Evan and them do, I just can't do it for one, I'm just, I feel, I feel like I've, I've reached a limit, um, you know, everybody's got their own genetic potential. I feel like I'm better suited to lift heavy weights. I'm better at it, so I do it. And the second reason is because it's, it's a lot more tangible for me. Bodybuilding is a very subjective sport. Um, you're looking in the mirror. You're always constantly judging. Have I done this? Is my body fat lower? Does my peak on my bicep look better? Whatever the case may be. And in powerlifting, it's simple. Did I put more weight on the bar? Did I do another rep? I did? Great. Progress. <laughs> it's, it's, it's much easier to judge that over, over the years. And you can see where you're at now. You can see where you're at. Um, you know, when you started, you can see how far you've come. You know, when you get hurt, you can see, well, shit, I got this far to go until I get back up on top, get back where I was. Um, you know exactly what you got to do to catch this guy. And sometimes that seems out of reach at times. You know, and uh, I got to admit, every time I, my phone buzzes and I get a Facebook update that says, Dan Green just posted a video, my head drops. And I think, oh, shit. <laughs> now, now what's he done? So, uh, but yeah, it's, um, there's a lot of similarities. Um, I do enjoy bodybuilding. I enjoy doing some of the non-powerlifting exercises. I enjoy getting the pump going in and, and getting that good feeling because sometimes powerlifting just kicks the shit out of you and you just, you don't leave with the pump, you just leave tired. You feel like you may not have done anything until the next morning when you try to get out of bed. And <laughs> you, can't, you can't pick your feet up. Um, there's a lot of similarities from, from nutrition uh, to work ethic um, to planning out routine. You know, I'm sure Evan, he's got his diet laid out for weeks ahead of time. He's probably got some sort of training protocol laid out ahead of time to focus on what he needs. Um, and it's just, it's a love of the game. And, you know, I think, I don't think there's any one way to do it right. You know, you've got pros from all walks of life in both bodybuilding and powerlifting. They've all got their own style. It all seems to work. Uh, you just got to find what suits your personality and, you know, a system that you believe in and follow it. And uh, you'll start making some progress. Thanks. How you guys all doing? Good. All right. Yeah, I guess uh, when I look at, you know, what uh, bodybuilders are doing and powerlifters are doing, I think the, the big thing for me is it just comes down to the, the real difference is just that we're, you know, we're all doing the same thing. We're all, you know, trying to lift weights, get more muscle to be stronger, to be bigger. Um, but in the end, just the, the difference is just what we prioritize. So, you know, for a power lifter, <clears throat> I mean, you have to obviously prioritize, you know, one rep maxes is the most important thing. Um, diet has to be a secondary priority. Where in a, you know, bodybuilder's training, you know, one rep max is not a high priority, but, um, you know, diet has to be, you know, perfect. So, you know, we're all doing the same things, but just which kind of order we, we set things out is kind of the big thing. <clears throat> and uh, when I set out, you know, how do I approach my training, I think what's really important is, uh, 
you know, if a one rep max is the most important thing in powerlifting, then getting to the point where you can do as much as you can, as close as close to possible, as close as possible to you know hitting heavy one rep maxes as you know as frequently as possible, uh, the better. And the big the big caveat there is you know how much you know can you actually do that? And there are a lot of things that factor into you know how much you can kind of chase your priority. Yeah, everyone was saying, you know, for him it might be a big deal. It might not be a big deal if he can squat eight plates or seven plates, and it might not be a big deal if he can, you know, put six plates on the bar. But if you know how much squatting you can do with five plates is a big deal. Sometimes you're gonna have to be able to squat six plates to really do a lot of work with five plates. True. <clears throat> so, so he's got to be strong enough to get, you know, the weight on the bar that's gonna make him get big enough. Um, and we've got to get, like me and Sam, we've got to get big enough, you know, where we can tolerate, you know, the heaviest training. So there's a, you know, there's a blend of like, you've got to be big enough to get strong, or in Evan's case, you've got to get strong enough to be big. Uh, but we just prioritize them, you know, opposite directions. That's a great way to put it. I never thought of the word, but it's like perfect. Yeah, and so to me, as a body, or as a, as a lifter, people think, a lot of times that they're going to, you know, they want to know, do I ever want to be a bodybuilder? And to me, the idea of being a bodybuilder is about, like Sam said, when you're, when you're a kid and you start, or when you're a teenager or whatever, everybody wants to get big and everybody wants to get strong. So to me, that's, that's being a bodybuilder, even if I'm not competing. You know, I've been an Olympic weightlifter too, and you don't actually have to be a competitive Olympic weightlifter to, you know, clean a barbell or you know, lift the weight over your head. It's still a clean and press. It's still a, you know, snatch if you do it, even if you're not in a competition. So the idea of actually, you know, training like a bodybuilder, you know, that's a sort of a moot point. You know, maybe I'm not a competitive bodybuilder per se, but, you know, we all, we all lift weights, right? So to me, that's, that's kind of the same thing. <clears throat> so my next point would be that when I started off, you know, training, training like a bodybuilder to me is about putting on the mass that it's going to then take to tolerate, you know, the heaviest training. When I looked at, like, how do you, like, who, who really is the strongest and has the most fundamentally kind of proven program? As an Olympic weightlifter, you can look at the, uh, if you guys are familiar with the, like, Bulgarian kind of weightlifting program. They'd had, like, 50 world championships coming from a tiny, tiny country. And I think they were, you know, kind of known as the country where their weightlifting program just revolved around, you know, training to your max every day, multiple times a day, and really not having a lot of variation in their training programs. So to me, that's kind of like the pinnacle of getting to where you can tolerate just specifically focusing on your one goal. But I think the misconception is a lot of those guys, a lot of people look at it and like, oh, that's all they do, and only the genetically gifted ones can do it, you know, whether it's physical genetics or mental. I think the big misconception is that the big question is like, what do those guys do when they're 10 years old that let them get to that point when they're 25 or what do they do when they're 15 or 20? Cause they didn't just start out, you know, doing a million snatches every day. Um, except I guess actually what I'd heard is that some of them, when they were, when they're kids, they're pretty much doing like, you know, the lightest weight possible, but you know, they might do a couple hundred snatches in a day and that's, that's kind of building up their foundation. And so to me, if you're going to do, you know, heavy squats a couple times a week and other people look at you like, well, how do you tolerate that training? Well, you've got to have built up all the, the fundamental things like, you know, building up, you know, your muscle size, you've got to have built up flexibility so you can tolerate it. And you've got to just kind of a built up conditioning so your muscles can just recover from whatever you're doing. And then, you know, we talked about, you know, kind of him being strong enough to get bigger, or us being big enough to get strong. I think one of the things that's that I kind of grew up thinking about bodybuilders is like you're supposed to get massive before you try to get your you know like the details of your physique that may or may not be true but that's kind of how I what I read and what I thought was kind of the way to go but for powerlifters it's kind of the opposite you know you might need to do a lot of curls when you're growing up you might need to do a lot of tricep extensions to kind of put all the mass on and all the little places you need to have it so you can tolerate a lot of benching but once you've gotten to a certain point, you can ask yourself, like, all right, how many tricep pushdowns do I need to do to get, like, a 500-pound bench? 
um, where I can also say, okay, how many times do I need to be able to rep, you know, 425 if I'm going to bench 500? It's a very tangible answer when you look at, you know, 425 bench for reps equaling 500 versus like, okay, I'm going to do like laterals with a 20 pound dumbbell. How many times am I going to have to do that? And it's son of a impossible answer. So it gets to a point in your training where you have to say, all right, I'm not building a foundation anymore. I'm turning the foundation into actual, you know, an actual progression of like how I train where you can sort of get more and more specificity towards your goal. Um, and I'm sure with bodybuilders too, there comes a point where you get in so much mass that you're, that's not really what you need anymore. Then it's getting, you know, then it's working out the details in your physique or, you know, figuring out just how dialed in you can get in your diet. Of course, <laughs> me speculating, but I think those are kind of the similarities is you've got all the things you need to pursue, but eventually to get to be the best, you've got to be able to really, really, really dial in, you know, the, the most specific points in your sport. Okay, we want to give you guys time to ask all the questions you want, so I'm going to open it up to you guys. Uh, if you could just really speak up loudly uh, so we can hear you. Uh, if you want to state your name and just ask the question to whichever athlete or to the whole panel if you want. Uh, who wants to go first? Um, Justin Martin, I um, just got a question for the panel as far as training with injuries and how you move forward past them through your, you know, especially when you're trying to get ready for a show or a competition, like, how do you rebound from those, or how do you change your training programs? To is that for anybody specific, or that's that's for the panel? Because I mean, kind of do bodybuilding and powerlifting okay. at the same time. So Sam's got the most recent injury, so Smart. maybe you can uh, talk about your injury and then answer that. Yeah, that really just varies. Um, how to train around injuries varies from injury to injury, person to person, and what you've got going on. Uh, my most recent injury, um, I got the brilliant idea to do a charity strongman competition and tore my bicep off the bone, had to have it reattached, and now I'm having some post-surgical complications, calcium deposit type thing that's growing in there. I've got to wait and have that cut back out again in a few months. So right now I'm kind of in a holding pattern. Um, I can't really do anything. I can't straighten my arm, can't bend it. Um, I'm just using the time to rest and recover. I've kicked the crap out of myself for the last... 12 or 13 years uh, on the platform, and I've got a lot of nagging injuries that I'm just trying to stay out of the gym and let them heal up, I'm trying to work on my mobility a little bit, um, do other things in life. I talk about balance a lot. I'm trying to spend more time with my wife, go on hikes, do the things that she likes to do, stuff that I haven't done for 12 years because I've been too concerned that it's going to take away from my total or it's going to mess up my diet, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm just taking it easy right now. Um, letting my batteries recharge so that when I, I am able to go again, I can go full steam. Um, this has been my most serious injury uh, so far. It's put me out for three months now, at least another four or five months uh, down the road until we get this thing cleared up. Um, most of my other stuff's been nagging. I've had some both my knees scoped for meniscal tears, uh, an MCL tear. I had my left shoulder scoped out for a labral tear and a bicep tear uh, on my left shoulder as well. Um, and then just nagging injuries, a lot of low back pains. Um, my knees are usually pretty bulletproof, but most of my pain comes in my hips and my low back. And uh, as far as training around those, you've just got to try to figure out what hurts and or figure out what doesn't hurt and do that. Um, and you've got to know the difference between what's, you know, what's an ache and what's a pain and what's an injury. Um, and, and be smart enough to know when to back off and know when to do something else and not push through it and do something stupid and make it worse. Uh, it's very difficult to give any um, detailed answers uh, for something like that. You know, like I said, I try to stay away from the heavy weight. I'm the exact opposite of Dan. Dan's banging it every week. Um, I still don't know how he does it. I understand the tolerance. I understand the threshold levels, but you know, it still makes me shake my head every week when I, when I see him post his videos. Uh, me, I like to train more explosively. Uh, it, I, I think it helps me. I say it helps me prevent injury, but shit, I'm injured all the time, so <laughs> maybe I need to reapproach my, my philosophy a little bit, but uh, you know, I, I try to, to, to train more explosively. I use what's called compensatory acceleration training. It's somewhere in the 60 to 80% range most of the time, and, and build most of my volume up with you know, 60, 70% of my one rep max through multiple sets, lower reps, and then as the competition gets closer, I cut out all the extra stuff and just start increasing the weights 
and decreasing the reps. Um, you know, a lot of times you can do things with a shorter range of motion. So a lot of my shoulder problems come on the bench press because I've got very poor internal and external rotation, which is very common with most people. It comes from slumping over a desk like this all the time. You know, so your shoulders get rolled forward and you lose a lot of range of motion in your bench press, that, that internal rotation, that last two inches, if you don't have proper internal rotation, first thing that happens is that shoulder comes forward and slams the humerus up into your, into your shoulder girdle. And something as simple as a board press um, could take away that range of motion, help keep some of the inflammation down so that when you do have to, to compete, you haven't been banging it up every week. Uh, of course, try to stay on top of your mobility because once it's gone, it's very difficult to get back. I wish I'd listened to my coaches in high school. Um, it's much easier to maintain than it is to get back. Um, prehab is always easier than rehab, I promise you. Um, something as simple, uh, Dan gave me some great advice on deadlift. Uh, I used to have a lot of low back pain uh, from where my hips are so tight all the time. My low back tries to compensate, and I had a lot of low back pain uh, from squatting and pulling. I used to squat and pull twice a week. And Dan gave me some great advice to start doing my deadlifts off a four-inch block. Um, one, to help learn, learn sumo technique, but two, to try to improve my flexibility in those positions um, and try to take some of the, uh, I guess, the pain associated with with that, the inflammation away from just constantly kicking the crap out of myself. And that made a tremendous difference. So just finding little things. Um, you know, there's a million things we can cover. I'm sure there's a lot of stuff online. We're all on the forums. You can ask forums if you have specific questions about that type of thing. But things like board presses, uh, things like uh, accommodating resistance or, you know, Mark Bell's slingshot. Something that takes some of the pressure off the off your shoulders in the hole, um, anything like that. Box squats. Um, I'm not a big advocate of box squats, but when my hips are acting up, box squats don't act, seem to aggravate them quite as much. I'm able to sit back a little bit more, and it just changes the uh, the direction and the pressure a little bit. So just trying to find what doesn't hurt and do that until you can do what you want to be doing is pretty much it. The best thing to do is don't get injured in the first place. And you know, it's what's funny is if you look at kids, right? You know, babies, kids, kids don't get hurt, right? I mean, you could do crazy shit when you were a kid and not get hurt, right? Do things wrong, you know, do wild things, take a big fall, you don't get hurt. It's because your body is healthy, right? Everything's flexible, stuff's not tight. You haven't had a chance to really screw anything up yet. And the more we, you know, beat up, beat our bodies up, and you neglect certain things, you're much, much more likely for injury. I think if you, um, if you put, put a lot of emphasis on good nutrition, being hydrated, staying loose, and you basically you keep your body healthy, I mean, healthy, healthy muscles, unless you, I guess, do something really, really wrong, you're not very likely to tear a muscle or, or blow something out, and I guess under any, any load that's possible. But I think the healthier your, your tissue is and the better everything is working, the less likely you are to get injured. Um, so I think the best thing, and even if you do find yourself, and we're all going to have some type of injury, whether it's acute or not, I think the best thing to do is considering that blood, blood carries everything you need, right, to live, oxygen and nutrients and things like that. It's ultimately, it's, your body will heal itself, but you have to help it heal itself with, with the right nutrients, being hydrated, or, you know, uh, removing metabolic waste. And I think by staying active, um, trying to maybe train through injury, but staying active in that uh, if, if, if injury happens in motion, usually the best way to heal it is probably with, with some type of motion, I think. Because a lot of times you go to the doc, say you, say you go to a regular doc, you say, oh, doc, my back hurts. He said, well, don't go to the gym. You know, take, take two months from the gym. And obviously, we're not going to do that. And a lot of times you find if you, if you do it right, you just you keep training, um, give it the proper attention needs, and it just goes away. Whereas if you probably, if you were to just stop everything, you're probably just going to get worse. So try to prevent it. But if it does happen, help your body, you know, help your body through it. Use it. I think <clears throat> when you stop using your body, you're much more likely to get hurt. <clears throat> um, staying active and just keeping your body healthy. Health, as much as, you know, you're not powerlifting to be the healthiest person, you're not bodybuilding to be the healthiest person, to be successful at, at either of those endeavors or, or any sport, you have to be healthy. I mean, look, look at the NFL, look at those guys, look at the hits they take, look at the tumbles they take. I mean, their bodies are in great physical condition, and that's what enables them to get through it, I think. You want to talk about Andrew? Yeah. All right, um, I guess there's a... 
this would be a pretty pretty long topic if we wanted to be, but um, just a couple things. One of the things that uh, that Sam's mentioned is, you know, that I, I, I tend to train really heavy, and that would be like a, you know, based on a, you know, percentage of like a max weight that you could lift. Um, but one of the things that, that I do that helps to kind of deal with how much stress you're putting in your body is, um, you know, for every, you know, squat, bench, or deadlift, there are kind of versions of each lift that I feel are relevant. Um, and each one you're gonna have a different max set. So when I do my leg training, um, it tends to revolve around four things. There could be uh, back squats, like in, a, like in a meet, so like a low bar squat with uh, knee wraps, which is gonna be the heaviest squat that I'm gonna be doing. Um, there are gonna be back squats, low bar with no knee wraps. So that's gonna be still pretty heavy and a lot of loading on, on the hips and back. Um, there'll be high bar squatting with a closer stance, deep, like not to parallel, but you know, to the, the bottom of the range of motion I can get to. And there will be front squats, which will be even, even lighter. Um, again, with kind of a closer stance, a deep range of motion. And so the, the real benefit there is I can train any one of those things and get a great effect of strength if I train them all heavy. But, you know, if one of them has a, a max of 600, one has a max of 700, one has a max of 800, and one 850, I can take those numbers and I, if I'm squatting, you know, 600 pound front squat, that's a max, but 600 pounds on my spine feels great compared to 800 pounds on my spine uh, or my hips. So the thing is, is you can, you can actually control like what kind of a pounding you're giving, you're dishing out to your body. Um, the same thing on a bench, you know, if there's, you know, your max bench and then there's, you know, rep benches or there's a closer wide grip bench where you can train just as hard but with a lighter weight and get a great effect on the muscle or the muscles involved. Those are uh, kind of simple ways to give your body either a break, you know, as a plan. Like if I just competed a bunch of times, uh, I've, I've been doing the heavy lifts. I've been doing the competition, you know, squats a lot. Um, but let's say after I compete, I want to give my body a break for a couple months. I can stay away from the competition squats and I can just do like high bar squats and low bar squats. I can train just as hard, but with giving my hips and my back a break more. Um, and then when I'm ready to go back to the heavy weights, you know, some of those things where, you know, you've got to crack your back 20 times a day because your, you know, your spine and your ribs are knotted up. Some of those things have a chance to kind of work themselves out. So in terms of like a year, a year long plan or just, you know, kind of for longevity, that's a pretty smart way to train. If you always do the same thing, your body's gonna kind of lose its incentive to adapt. It's gonna kind of lose its effect as a new, you know, stimu stimulus. So in that sense, that's like a preventative way. More recently, at the very beginning of the year, I tore like a quad and IT band area, muscle, you know, some of the muscle in there. And it was like about, I don't know, a couple weeks before my, my first of two meets. One was gonna be in Los Angeles, and then two weeks later, um, the Raw Unity meet. So I was, of course, you know, like, not panicked, but I was like, shit, you know, I need to get my shit together and make this uh, heal up as best as possible and not let it get worse. Um, so the first thing I did is I basically kept squatting and made it, made it worse <laughs> because, you know, we're all competitive and tend to, you know, feel like, all right, it's not, a, it's not an injury yet, it's just kind of a nagging pain. Um, but then it became, you know, an injury. And uh, <clears throat> so... I've had injuries before and I kind of knew what I would need to do for, uh, you know, for a muscle injury, you know, there's going to be some swelling, so you got to ice, you got to, you know, use like a compression wrap, um, possibly some heat. And again, when I would take like a wider stance, that would really put a lot more pressure on that area. But if I squatted with a, with a higher bar position and kind of a close stance, I could get away with still training my legs, but giving that kind of pressure on my hips a little bit of a break. And so, to me, that's just kind of a, you know, that was my plan to kind of strategically approach training as hard as possible, um, given, you know, that circumstance. Uh, and it works well, because like I said, I can, I can still do a different version of the lift with a lot less pain and a lot less risk of injury, and still train that lift very hard. So I'm not really having to just take a vacation and hope that when I show up at the meet, you know, I'm not going to get hurt and things will be all right. <laughs> I can still put heavy weights on my back and just kind of 
you know, know how much stronger I can go from one lift to the next when I actually, you know, set up like in a competition lift. Uh, <clears throat> so then again, so you have like, like I said, a long-term kind of way to set up your training. So you're not planning to just overload your body all the time. And then you have kind of a, you know, a, <laughs> you know, injury and where you can kind of deal with it with the, uh, the second, the second kind of a uh, anecdote. Um, and then a big thing for me too is in terms of prevention is a uh, well proper proper mobility I guess and to me for a lifter you know since you've got a squat and deadlift you really really need to keep your hips mobile and healthy and if you're gonna bench and squat you've got to keep your shoulders really healthy and so the shoulder shoulder mobility basically starts with your uh, you know your upper back spinal kind of motion and your, uh, your shoulder blade mobility. Um, and that's such a big one because I see a lot of lifters that get really tight in the shoulders, you know, and so they can bench all right, but they get, you know, a lot of pain from it. And so that limits how much benching they can do. Or when they squat, you know, their uh, biceps and shoulders get kind of uh, tightened up or inflamed. And, and then again, that limits how much you can train. So going back to my first point, we were first talking about, you know, just what is, you know, what are powerlifters and bodybuilders pursuing? To me, the more often you can pursue your goal as closely as possible to your goal, the better. And so, you know, like preventing, I guess it goes without saying, but the importance to me is really high on preventing injury because, you know, if I can't train more than the next guy, then, you know, he's, he should have a good chance to beat me. So, you know, prevention is pretty important. All right. Like I said, don't forget. <laughs> All right, we'll take the uh, next question. Um, just for the sake of time, so you guys can all answer your questions, maybe you guys should uh, ask it to a specific athlete. Um, so who wants to go next? Uh, my name is Jennings from Georgia. Um, this is for Dan. Uh, one, just thanks for everything you put out. It's super helpful. Um, but, you know, you guys are all at the top of your game. You're all legends in your sports. I'm wondering if you can just touch a little bit on because um, most of us are beginners or intermediates, what you did to get to that level. So you know, kind of that, that beginning intermediate stage when you were at 1,200 total and what you think really pushed you to become uh, that, that elite athlete um, in powerlifting. Okay. Um, I guess I pretty much started lifting, you know, following just playing every sport I could play, you know, growing up. Um, I think my first exposure to weightlifting was just middle school, you know, every day when we would change clothes at, you know, in the locker room to go to PE class. We had like a bench, so I would just do like, you know, max bench once a day, every day. And uh, <laughs> that was my introduction to weightlifting. Um, about two years later, I basically did like, you know, one max set of bench every day. And that was, that was still about as far as I got into to weightlifting at that point. Um, but I think when I, was, when I was 15, I think I bought like muscle and fitness. And, you know, I was like, oh, these, these bodybuilders have some pretty good plans for their workouts. So I started you know, just learning that you can train your back and learning you can squat and stuff like that. And so I think I just got started with the basic lifts with the idea that I'm, you know, this is how you train. You know, you squat, you bench, deadlift, you know, shoulder presses. And if, to me, it was obvious I wanted to be as big and strong as possible. You know, I watched movies with like Arnold and Sylvester Stallone and, you know, there, that was just it. You know, that's just what I wanted was to be strong and big, and awesome. And so I pretty much started training just with the basic lifts, but just doing the approach of, you know, maybe doing sets of eight or sets of 10 or 12 and just getting big. And as long as my, you know, my sets kept going up, that's all I really cared about. I didn't really do a lot of maxing ever until I was in much, much further down, down the road in college. So I probably maxed on my, uh, my bench, you know, a couple times here and there, but I don't think I ever really maxed in my squat or my deadlift when I was in college. It just it was more about like reps. And uh, when I first got, you know, the idea of doing a competition, my buddy basically told me he's like, "Oh, you're really strong. You should train for a meet." And you know, I decided I was going to do it. Wound up getting hurt snowboarding. I sprained my back, and so about a year later, I actually felt healthy enough, and I started after I graduated college working as a trainer so I was ready to pursue something competitive there and uh, trained for my first meet it was a uh, the NASA 
nationals in Las Vegas, 2007, I think it was like June or July. And I think when I started training, I tested my maxes. I had like 500 squat, 535 deadlift, and a 365 bench. Trained for about six months, um, doing some like West Side stuff, squatted 500 at the meet, and uh, deadlifted close to 630. It was like a 617, and then I missed 635, and uh, benched. I think I benched 396, but made the rookie mistake of benching and then like throwing it back on the rack before I got told to. So I was pretty hooked after that. Just um, that was my first meet, and at that point I was I was trying to train. So I basically started, like I said, training kind of like a bodybuilder. When I started doing kind of a West Side training approach, it was pretty much maxing on a lot of box squatting, um, squatting against bands for a while, and uh, for deadlifting I would kind of just do whatever I felt like. And uh, for benching, various maxes and board presses. Um, did that for about two years. So my bench went up a little bit. My, uh, my squat went up a little bit. And uh, my deadlift had gone up pretty well initially and then kind of stalled out after a while. Um, after that, I think what I switched to was more of a, you know, just getting back to training the main lifts. So just, you know, squatting without a box. Um, deadlifting with actual kind of like a plan. You know, I, I basically started deadlifting from the floor, from blocks, from pins, from a deficit, and those were kind of the main things. And uh, benching, again, it was just a, like a heavy day, and then I would do a high rep day. And that was, that was kind of what helped kind of get my bench going a little further. Um, and where I've been at for the last few years is that, you know, now I will add in the heavy lifting and the volume lifting on the same day for all the lifts, and uh, that seems to work pretty well. So you get the specificity of like training the main lift every time you train. You know, so I do a lot of pause benching, but then to add in volume, I'll do a lot of touch and go benching, um, or close grip or wide grip benching. And those are, you know, pretty close to actual benching. And, it, you know, that's, that's really what's helped. Not a lot of uh, like tricep isolation, not a lot of, you know, isolation stuff, but just very, very close variations to the main lift. Enough variation where your body's like, you know, still likes doing it, but uh, close enough where it actually has a good carryover to just getting you strong. That's for Evan. Um, yesterday, your back was greatly improved since your last show, and even more so since the Olympia. And I was wondering if there's anything that you would attribute to that improvement. Um, I was able to deadlift a bit heavier in this this prep compared to the, my, I was having some back trouble prior to the Olympia and you know just hold, held me back a little bit so I was able to barbell row and deadlift a bit heavier and I think that made a big difference but then also probably just coming in a bit fuller there's more pop and it, sometimes is, is it did you really gain it or did you have it you just weren't able to showcase it prior so that's probably a combination of both a little bit of something gained and then something brought forth that was prior you know was, was already there but you didn't know it so probably a combination of the two. Yeah, last night's show, um, <clears throat> I just got a kind of a comment and then a question, but I thought for a change, uh, those guys at the top five, dead balls right. I mean, I was just wondering how you feel about your placing and do you get bent out of shape like a guy who plays sixth? Um, I mean, do, do you handle your placing well? Do you feel good about it? you just want to get back out there and do it again next time? or? Yeah, I mean, I've never felt like, oh, man, I'm going to fucking kill myself. You know what I mean? I'm going to quit. You know, I... Um, I've always felt like, well, you know, even even a couple of times where you know I didn't, uh, you know, I get the Olympia, I felt like, well, I could have been a lot better, bummer, but nothing. I'm gonna hang myself over. All right, dude, go back to the gym, fix it, and you know, you get on stage again. Um, I, I thought, I thought, I thought the placings were fair. I, I've never, to be honest, I've never felt like I got screwed. You know, like, oh, this was terrible, and how did they put me here? And I, I should have won. You know, and I placed tenth. <laughs> you know, but you got guys, you got guys that are like that. Uh, I've never felt that way. It's um, probably because competition is maybe like my least favorite part of it. I, I really love the training. I love the process. So the stage thing is kind of a formality for me, um, but it's probably the, the part I enjoy the least. Um, so I probably don't put a whole, not that I don't put a whole lot of uh, emphasis on it. I do, but um, it's not it's not everything to me. But I was content with my placing, and I thought I thought the guys in the top five, I thought it was a great lineup, and I thought everybody was really great. I was I was 
happy as hell, you know, like the pre-judging, they called the first four guys, you know, for that first call out, and then they called me, so I was just really happy to be in that. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really satisfied with it, I'm very happy. Next question. Eric, I got one kind of for you. <laughs> I'll steal something from my, uh, my guys yesterday. You, you ever think about putting, at least for an event like this, some bleachers around the cage? Because there's yeah. a lot of cool shit that goes around the cage, and I gotta tell you, we Most of the time, we just, we just buzz uh, right through it because there's no way we're seeing what's going on in there. <laughs> yeah, we probably do need that. Or big screen. Yeah, I mean, we always think about that, you know, every year, how, how we can improve on the, uh, on the experience for people. I think we need to get Animal up on the main stage and have the crowd around the platform. Or when someone else had mentioned, get it out of the freak. I know you want to be in the center of the thing, but get it out to the side at least where all that other weird shit's going so people can see you. Yeah. <laughs> well... You know, I don't want to spend too much time on this because I want this to be about the athletes, but yeah, every year we kind of sit down and we try and figure out how we can improve the experience for you guys, and uh, we take all that stuff into consideration. We, we, we can put bleachers on the outside, they won't let us do that at the expo, but you know, it's something that we do consider and we'll, we'll keep trying to think about ways that we can improve the experience for you guys. We're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah. How, about a, how about a lift off on the main stage, floor record squat? Possible. Anything's possible. We, uh, you know, we were the title sponsors at Royal Unity this year, so anything's possible. How about some more questions for the for the guys? Uh, why is training so uh, uh, timing so important for you on your training? Who are you asking that for? You, right. I'm sorry. One more time. Why is uh, timing so important on yeah, my training? Like during the day, like you know, I know you say oh. you don't like to train in the morning. You know, right. You like get a few moments. Right. Go to the gym. I think it's when you feel best. Um, I mean, to, to be honest, I like training at night. I am, I'm probably my most powerful and most energetic and have my the best uh, stamina and endurance at night and best pump and all that. But then you're left only getting in a meal or two That's usually how I, I train at like 6, 6.30 at night. Right. And then by the time you're done training, even getting that next meal in is right. difficult, let alone getting two or three in. Right, right, right. And for, and for that reason, I prefer to train more late morning or midday. So, okay, I've got a couple of meals in me, but then I get, a, you know, plenty in post, post training. I guess, I guess maybe in a perfect world, you train, you know, somewhere, you know, if you eat six meals a day, you eat after, you train after your third, so you got three in and then three after. So a lot of it's for recuperation, but like, I, I was never the type like, oh, I'm going to get up and, uh, you know, on an empty stomach, go train. Cause you know, first thing in the morning, I just always felt like crap. Yeah. Um, so I think it's whenever you feel best and then also planning it in terms of your recuperation and obviously you know I have, I have the luxury of being able to train more or less when I want I mean, back when I was working full-time I just you know take what I had and you make it work you know so yeah. it's a combination of all that we're right up in uh, Poughkeepsie New York oh so. you, should, you should stop by yeah definitely next question I guess this is for Sam since you were talking about how you got hurt doing the strong man um, I'm looking for a way to incorporate, I guess, some events training into my, my regular powerlifting regimen. One, to break up the monotony, and two, because I'm a fireman and I need some sort of functional fitness instead of just getting, I know closer to meet, I don't want to tax myself too much, um, but I'd like to get more wind, you know, be better at work and things like that. So would you recommend doing those things on the days if you were going to, or have just an events type training day where you focus one day on just getting your GPP up? Well, that's a tough question. Uh, I don't do a whole lot of strongman training. I've done it. Three times now, and I've gotten hurt every time. I guess. <laughs> well, but I'll rephrase it. How, where would you think you would best do it to where it's not going to affect your total, but you're still going to keep a better wind? Is that easier? Yeah, it would be some sort of accessory work. Um, I would concentrate mine more away from a powerlifting meet. I would try to keep it out yeah. um, as I'm getting closer to a powerlifting meet personally, and do it maybe right after a meet when I'm I'm beat up and I'm bored and I'm just looking for a change of pace. Yeah. Um, some of the events, you know, a, a carry or a sled drag or that sort of thing is always great for hips or for conditioning. And those um, things, I mean, if you're doing them on like your, your heavier squat or deadlift day, you're pretty much already taxed, so you can use it like as a yeah, it, accessory, it, right? Right. It really just depends on how you've got your training laid out, and you don't want to uh, put so much emphasis on your, your cardio and your conditioning that takes away from your total. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it's a wave of volume and intensity. And, of course, the, the better you get, the closer you get to power to meet, the better you want to be at the lifts, which means the worse you are at everything else in life. That's right. Um, <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, I would just do it, uh, I guess, towards the end. Uh, like Dan said, I like to, to lump a lot of the volume stuff in on the main day. 
Uh, for me, I get so taxed from the heavyweights. If I try to put in, you know, Louis Simmons preaches accessory days, accessory days, you know, more GPP, uh, that sort of thing, and do all these extra exercises. Shit, I don't have the energy, the time, really the desire to do that. Um, so I like to get it one day, hit it, and try to be rested and recovered for the next time, whenever that may be, whether it's a day and a half later like Dan or four or five days later like me. Um, you just got to figure out how to fit it into your training and just don't overemphasize it. But I would I would say don't go too heavy on some of that stuff because uh, it's just a recipe for disaster in my opinion. I think it's great to watch, but uh, it's a lot of fun to do until it gets heavy and then it just hurts. and It's, it's a catastrophe waiting to happen. Next question. I'll ask one. Oh, you got one? Yeah, yeah. just uh, wondering if you guys, uh, Sam, and, Sam and Dan, touch on nutrition and uh, how that's evolved for you guys too and, and what you've seen the most success for. You're always kind of touching on. Yeah, you, you, you can touch too. Just on no, 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 no. I mean, you really don't you pick one. <laughs> uh, on just touching on, on kind of, you know, overall macros, what you find works best for you as far as, you know, carbons, carbs, and protein and fats. Um, my diet's pretty much run the gamut over the years. I've done a little bit of everything from John Berardi, uh, nutrient timing to... Chef Berardi. Yeah, I've done some of that too. Ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I, I found that ice cream is, uh, is, a, is a great recovery tool. I've also recently found that it doesn't work so well when you're not working out. <laughs> it's not, not quite as anabolic. <laughs> but seriously, um, I've done everything from, from a real high-carb diet uh, like uh, Chris Aceto, however you say his last name, used to preach the you know two and three times your body weight in carbs. I've done the really low carbs. Uh, I've done the keto type stuff. I've never tried the carb backloading uh, or anything like that. But and, I, and I've done everything where it's just you figure out you need 400 grams of carbs, 400 grams of protein, divide it by six meals, and you know spread it evenly throughout the day. Um, I've tried it all. It all seems to work to some degree. Um, I found for me it's just easier to. Uh, either spread it all out into consistent meals so I don't have to think about it so much, or I'll um, just try to lump them in at breakfast, my carbs in at breakfast, and then before and after my workout. And depending on whether or not I'm trying to cut weight or gain weight, I'll add a, a fourth carb meal in um, for me. And then ice cream, you know, once a week or <laughs> whatever, whatever, whenever I feel like it. Whenever, it, it depends on how I'm training. Uh, capo, it was about every day. Post surgery, it was about every day too. It probably wasn't a good idea. Um, but yeah, you know, Evan, I think he's done a high carb diet before. I, I don't know what he's doing now. I think he's doing fairly low, or he did for a while, fairly low, and switched to something else. Um, you know, it just, it really depends on, it, it's all effective. It's what um, you need, when you need it, to figure that out, and whatever it is, it is. Yeah, um, whatever, whatever you can live with. Um, I try to put a little bit of variety in there these days. I used to be able to just eat chicken and rice plain all the time, and same thing over and over and over, same time every day, but... I found that variety helps a lot, even if it's just red potatoes, sweet potatoes, and rice. It, the same thing every day, just three different meals the same day. I found that helps a lot. Uh, but I don't know that there's any, any secret to it. I don't know if there's any magic ratio. Uh, your metabolism fluctuates depending on how much you eat. You cut the calories down, your metabolism drops. You can't just go from eating 2,000 calories to, all right, I'm going to gain weight. I'm going to slam 4,000 calories. And then, you know, yeah, you look full and great for three or four weeks, and that fifth week you wake up and like, <laughs> where did that come from? Um, you know, so it just kind of depends on where you're at and what you're doing now and adjust based on your metabolism. Uh, you know, you, you've seen the, the standard goals floating around of, you know, at least one gram of protein per pound of body weight. Try to get up towards two. I typically get about one and a half um, gram of protein just because it gets expensive eating all that stuff. Um, and I really don't like to cook. Um, carbo carbohydrates. You should watch Evan's uh, video. He did it all 100 bucks, right? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did see that. I still don't like to cook. <laughs> I, th I think Dan actually buys his pre cooked every once in a while, don't you? Yeah, so, you know, um, I don't know if there's any magic formula. Um, I'll let Dan talk about what he does. I know he's got a, a pretty strict dieting regimen. I don't know. I've, I've seen him eating some greens. Everybody else was eating a bunch of junk and. Dan's going to Whole Foods, or Sparkle's going to Whole Foods for Dan, getting him, getting him all the stuff he needs to stay lean. So I'll let him talk about that. Just, just. Um, yeah, I guess I've never, I've never actually counted macros <coughs> ever. Um, so I think when I was growing up, it was pretty much just the idea that I'm going to eat as much protein as I can. Um, 
And I think now what I've come to understand is, you know, the, the fat in your diet, if it's coming from the protein sources, um, you can decide how good of a protein source you're going to get. You know, so if you're eating, like, you know, canned meat, that's probably not the best choice. If you're, you know, if you're buying, you know, good steaks and sirloin and, your, you know, eggs and stuff like that, the fat in your diet is going to be from good sources. And, you know, it's very easy to just focus on eating as much protein as you've is you probably, you know, protein tends to be tasty, so as much as you can afford. And uh, then just having as many carbs after that as seems like you need. I guess, you know, I always just try to eat fairly basically like that. Um, but I've also, you know, never shied away from just eating as many cookies or as much ice cream as I wanted on top of the basic protein. So not very complicated. Uh, <laughs> Definitely now there are times where to make, you know, make my body weight stay in range of, you know, the weight class I'm trying to, trying to compete in, you know, I'll have to get pretty strict with the amount of food that I'm eating. But um, other than kind of restricting <laughs> carbs very heavily at certain times, I haven't really done anything, you know, that's, I mean, very, very specific. Like I said, you know, there have been times where I guess sort of like carb backloading, where I'm basically just having you know, a certain number of carbs surrounding a meal, and that's about it. Or surrounding a workout, sorry. Uh, a little bit before and a lot during and after. You know, I had like mixed results with that. You know, I mean, there would definitely be days where I'm like, you know what, I don't feel like I'm ready to train because I'm not carved up enough. So then I would just go and have, you know, a bunch of donuts before I'd work out. <laughs> and you know, I was not going to take the risk of having a bad workout so I could diet. Um, I mean that's that's pretty much what I've done is it's just more based on more based on feel you know the idea of taking in protein fat should come from protein regulating the number of carbs based on hunger and based on you know how much you're training and if your body weight's responding the right direction um, yeah so when you're trying to gain weight then you know adding more food and more carbs more uh, snacks and when you're trying to lean out then taking away some of the snacks and taking away some of the carbs is kind of the way to go. But I've, I mean, very basic. Like I said, I'm trying to have perfect workouts and just eat well enough. So that's that's about it. All right, guys, we have time for one more question for this group, and then uh, we'll get the other guys in here. So we're going to take the last question for these guys. Good. Next, uh, next events for the three of you. Oh, oh never mind. You <laughs> stretch it out. So the question was, uh, what's the next events for each of you guys? So you guys can all talk. I'll take it since I've got the mic. <clears throat> I don't know what's next for me. I was hoping to do the surgery. run. Yeah, surgery's next for me. <laughs> um, this competition, we'll just have to see how the surgery goes. I mean, I'm still up in the air about that. Uh, still pretty disheartened about the injury. Uh, sitting around doing nothing. It's not fun at all. I'm watching everybody else's numbers creep while mine go the other direction. and. Everybody else's weight, body weight creep up while mine creeps down, get smaller and softer. It's just not fun to watch, especially being at the Arnold, not in your best shape or anywhere near it. It's not fun. Um, so surgery, another three or four months. I'm hoping to be able to do uh, something towards the end of the year. Um, if not, maybe Raw Unity again next year in January. Uh, but we'll just have to have to see. Um, I don't really have any competitions that I'll be, uh, at least that I plan to compete in until November will be uh, relentless in Detroit. I'm not sure the exact date, but I know it's November. Um, you know, if something else comes up that's attractive, I might, I might add in another meet. But that's that's the plan for now. So a lot of downtime. We've got the Australian Grand Prix coming up this Saturday, um, and that should be it for now. Just want to thank these guys, Evan, Sam, and uh, and Dan. Uh, thank you guys for coming. We'll give them a hand, and then we'll uh, get set up for the next group.